I have a question for you. How many of you listen to podcasts? Podcast listeners in the room? Okay, a few. Uh, some of you maybe catch these on YouTube or like on, on, on TV at some point. Uh, but how many of you have ever listened to or watched any of those true crime podcasts or TV shows? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. So I'm a, I'm a fan. This is kind of a guilty pleasure of mine to listen to the true crime stuff. I know I'm supposed to be like a holy righteous person, but I sort of love hearing stories about how people... Uh, kill each other. It's terrible that I just said that, isn't it? Um, I, I really love hearing these stories about how people like commit a crime and then go to ridiculous lengths to try to cover it up. And then I, I love the ways that you hear that these people you know, get found out. It's wild. I don't know why I love it. There's definitely something wrong with me. Uh, but this is something that I enjoy listening to. And so on that note, as we start our sermon today, I want to begin this message by talking to you about murder. Yeah. Okay, so imagine if we're going to set the tone, right? Uh, we're going to travel way, way back in time. In fact, all the way to the beginning of human history, we're going to travel all the way back. And I'm going to tell you a story for a second about the very first murder that ever happened. Some of you know this story already. Uh, don't spoil it if you already know the ending, right? Uh, but imagine some of that, like, true crime podcast music playing in the background, right? And there's probably, like, a clock ticking. We're not really sure why, uh, but there's a clock ticking, you know, and every now and then there's, like, some ambient sound effects that happen in the background. And I'm going to try to talk, uh, you know, you just imagine, like, I've got, like, this, and then there were two brothers, that kind of voice. Like, I'm not going to actually tell the story like that, but that's how they tell these stories, right? So just imagine that we're traveling all the way back in time, and this is how this story begins. It begins in the beginning. For five days, God miraculously and powerfully created everything. And then, after five days, on the sixth day, it, God looks at himself and says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. And what we know about this story is that this is, this is the creation story. And God says about creation that it is good. And everything is good until all of a sudden one day everything is terrible. Everything falls apart. Sin enters into the world through poor decisions uh, and lies that were told. And Adam and Eve were forced to leave the Garden of Eden. And eventually, outside of the Garden, they began a family. And they have two sons, Cain and Abel. These are the first, two, the first brothers that we hear about in Scripture. And one day, Cain and Abel who have now apparently grown old enough that they have taken on jobs within their family. Cain is working in, uh, in the produce area, and Abel is working with the livestock. And these two brothers come to present offerings to the Lord. And Cain gives some unspecified random amount of his produce to God as an offering of the land, but God rejected it. Abel, the younger brother, comes along and he gives the firstborn from his flock, and God accepted it. Cain was, as the kids say, big mad. Uh, he was jealous. He was sulking. God comes to Cain and he says, why the long face? And Cain says, because you didn't accept my offering and you accepted my brother's offering. Meh. And he has this conversation with God and he walks away still sulking and upset. And after that moment, we pick up the story again in chapter 4, where it says, Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were out in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And here we have the story of the world's first murder. 
It's a tragic story. Brother killing brother over jealousy because, because they didn't get the love, he didn't get the love that he wanted from God. And God and Cain, after in this moment, they have after he has killed his brother, they have a powerful confrontation in three questions. Question number one: God says, Where is your brother, Abel? Now, this is an opportunity for Cain to confess. He doesn't take it. He replies with his own question. He says, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Like, what's the big deal? Am I responsible? What he's doing here is he's, he's, making, he's taking an attempt to distance himself from his brother's life and well-being. And God responds with a third question, which is actually an answer to the question, am I my brother's keeper? He says, what have you done? Now, this wasn't because God didn't know what he had done. It was because he was, it was like he was saying, how could you? What's going on in your heart that you felt like that was the appropriate response? And in, and in a very real way, this is the answer to Cain's question. Cain disingenuinely asks God, am I my brother's keeper? And God says, yes! What are you thinking? Of course you are. You are your brother's keeper from the very beginning of time. God has expected and commanded us rightfully to obey his instructions, to steward the planet, and to keep one another. And so when, we're, when God is asked, am I my brother's keeper, the answer emphatically every single time is yes. And so today I want to share with you a message that I'm calling my brother's keeper. In his book, The Third Option, pastor and author Miles McPherson says a keeper is a, is a person who guards, nurtures, and protects an honorable heart in another person. So the heart of being a keeper for your brother begins with understanding that, like we read at the beginning of Genesis, that all people are made in God's image. Look around. All of these people are made in God's image. And then that all Christians are your brothers and sisters in Christ. We have been adopted, grafted in, not to an organization, but into a family. Look around. The people around you. I said look around twice and not a single one of you looked around. Look around. These people are also made in the image of Christ. And those of us in this room who are inside a relationship with Jesus, you are my brother and my sister in Christ. We're family. So the goal of this message today is to honor what Jesus says in John chapter 13 when he says, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another, if you are a brother's keeper or a sister's keeper. I hope that today, as a result of this message, we will speak life into a culture of shared responsibility for each other. And that we would also be able to honor the rest of the body of Christ around the world. And so to that end today, I want to share with you three ways that you can be like a brother's keeper. Number one, as Christians, we are responsible to keep your brother secure in their faith. Now, when we hear resp being responsible for someone else's faith, there are a couple of things that might be coming to your mind. Right? You might be thinking of Scripture, like in Philippians 1.12, doesn't it say, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? That might be the first thing. Well, I, I, aren't I supposed to be working out my own salvation? You're telling me I have to be responsible for keeping somebody else's faith secure? And then the second thing you might be saying is, in light of Philippians 1.12, where I'm supposed to work out my salvation in fear and tr trembling, I'm having a hard enough time doing that. And now you want me to worry about... Somebody else? That seems like a little bit too much. And the reality is that Scripture makes it clear that this is an expectation and a responsibility for us. Paul writes about this to the believers in Rome. In Romans chapter 15, verse 1, he says, We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. And then again in Galatians chapter 6, he says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. I know that's a word that a lot of us forgot about in 2020, and we've got to just like redeem that word. In a spirit of gentleness. But what's the responsibility? To restore them. And then James actually emphasizes how important this is 
when he wrote in James chapter 5, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings a sinner back will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Now, our culture has pushed us to extremes. We usually respond to people's brokenness or people's bad behavior uh, in one of two ways. Number one, we completely ignore it, saying that we're just going to allow each people to, you know, just do you, uh, pursue your own truth and your own happiness. It's really none of my business. Or number two, we go to the other end of the extreme and we climb all the way into everyone's life and we say, this is my business every time I perceive that you've done something that I think is wrong. And then, and then I'm just going to like cancel, cancel, cancel if I don't like you. But I think the kingdom of God actually invites a third approach. The third approach is to build genuine loving relationships and then speak the truth in love wherever possible. The Hebrew word for the kind of loving community that, that develops a brother's keeper is the word chesed. Chesed means kindness and love between people. It's a loving, gentle, kind community of people with shared faith who are pointing in the same direction. And when somebody gets off track, we go, no, 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 that's not the way we behave. Get back in here. This is, you're welcome here. We love you too much to let you wander off like that. Again, when we see a brother or sister falling in sin, we are to restore them with a spirit of gentleness. And some of us are thinking as we're listening to this already, but I'm not good enough of a Christian to be responsible for somebody else's faith. And that might be true. I, I understand not everybody in this room or, or who will ever hear this sermon is going to be at the same level of maturity in our faith. Not everybody is something that Paul would call a strong Christian. So maybe you're the weak one. Maybe you're the person who is constantly falling into sin. And if that's you, I would say to you, this should still be encouraging to you. Because if you're the weak one, what did Paul say? Those of us who are strong, let's cover those who are weak and help them become strong. If we all took this responsibility seriously, then you would not be left alone to struggle in your weaknesses. The chesed would take responsibility for you and help you become strong. And if you allowed that to happen, which I understand can feel terrifying and vulnerable, but if the community we build here is safe, then you can confess when you have doubts and weaknesses. And the community will say, that's okay, let's build you up. And then one day you can be strong for somebody else. And then maybe you can begin to think about who you know who has not been walking with Jesus for as long as you have. If you've been walking with Jesus for like a month, for a week, for a day, somebody came to faith yesterday. And if our church is growing and doing the kinds of things that we should be doing on every platform and in every area around our community, then those who are coming to faith in Christ will be added to the church. If we have chesed for each other, that loving, gentle community, then we will build more people who need you to be strong for them. And you will be strong for them simply by, by virtue of the fact that you've been walking with Jesus longer than them. And you can say, I'm stumbling through this thing too. Come and journey with me. This is what we're invited to. This should feel like good news. I think it might be our doubts that actually make this feel like a heavy burden. So whenever we see someone stumbling in sin, we can say something loving and gentle to them. We can restore them to Christ and help them grow in Christ's likeness. And if we do not do this, if we do not keep our brothers and sisters secure in their faith, then I propose that we are no better than the Pharisee in a parable that Jesus once told. Luke records it in Luke chapter 18. He says this, two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed like this, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes up to heaven. But he beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this is what Jesus says after telling that. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified 
rather than the other, rather than the Pharisee. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Do you realize that being a brother's keeper is a function of kingdom humility? And so I said a moment ago that one of the reasons why we might not be a brother's keeper might be our own doubts about faith and we feel like we're disqualifying ourselves. And on the other end of the spectrum, one of the reasons we aren't a brother's keeper might be because we are too prideful to see that we should be the source of encouragement rather than comparing ourselves so we can make ourselves feel encouraged. Now, I don't know what side of that spectrum you're on. I'm not accusing you of being prideful or having doubts. I don't know, but I know God knows, and you probably have a good, reasonable idea about it yourself. The question is, what are you going to do about it? Will you keep your brother? Will you humble yourself, or will you believe that God has made you something of a gift to the world? If you can do that, then you too could go down from the presence of God justified, like the tax collector. I think that we have to see that we are like the Pharisee when we compare and when we judge, thinking that it's not our responsibility to help other people stand secure in their faith. We are called to keep our brothers and sisters in Christ secure in their faith. And secondly, we are responsible to keep our brothers from stumbling. Now, it is one thing. It's bad enough if you see your brother or sister in Christ in sin and do nothing. It is worse if you actually find out that it's your fault that they sinned. One of the blessings of life in Christ is that we have a lot of freedoms, right? We have freedom from religious bondage. And praise God for that. We We aren't bound up in religion, We have relationship, and there's religious activity that we do that is uh, made meaningful and, and enriches our life because of the personal relationship that we have with Christ, but we're not bound in religion because of Jesus. Amen? But then Paul writes about this idea in Romans chapter 14. He says, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to be a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. Now, when Paul uses this phrase stumbling block or he talks about being a hindrance, what he's saying is don't do anything in your perceived freedom in Christ that would cause another person to fall into an area where they're actually in bondage. Paul goes on in in Romans, he says in uh, Romans 14, starting in verse 14, he says, I know I am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. For if your brother or sister is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. And then down in verse 20, he says, Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. Again, we have great freedom in Christ. Amen? But not everyone will be free to engage in everything you can engage in. For example, you might have a problem with alcohol. Maybe God saved you out of an alcoholic background. It would be so unloving for me to say, hey, you want to have a meeting with Pastor Tim? Let's go meet at the local bar. I'll drink a beer in front of you. You get to have water. And the whole time what you're seeing is you're, you're actually learning from me. This is totally fine. And for me, that might be totally fine. And for you, you go home and go on a bender because your pastor told you it was okay with his actions. Yikes. Yikes. Now apply that to any other thing in your life that you have freedom in. Oh, I can watch those kinds of movies. Maybe your friends can't. I mean, we're going to have like Halloween in a couple weeks. We have conversations all the time. Can Christians engage in things like Halloween? I heard one pastor recently say, uh, engage in Halloween. In fact, I was just talking to some friends about this recently. And, And what we were talking about was how the wisdom says you can engage in Halloween at the level of your faith, but just know why you're doing it. Maybe God saved you out of a cult. It might not be a safe thing for you spiritually and emotionally and mentally to engage in Halloween the way your neighbors do. So find a safe place and 
and worship Jesus with safe people on that day. But maybe God in your freedom has called you to love your neighbors, and you can dress up like Moses if you need to, or, or a Star Trek character, or Doctor Who. Notice how nerdy I am. Those are the examples I came up with, right? Um, you could dress up on Halloween and go be the light to your neighbor and redeem a moment if that's what God has called you to. But then if in your freedom you look at a person who is, who is struggling and say, man, you just don't have the kind of freedom and faith that I've got. Man, you just stay home and turn the lights off and you can't celebrate Halloween. How dare you? In your freedom, be a stumbling block to somebody. Got quiet. Was that heavy? I mean, I talked about ninjas a second ago and Doctor Who and like, Star Trek characters, I, I, maybe it wasn't too heavy, right? The point is, you get to be free, but in your freedom, don't bind someone else up. Be a brother's keeper. Enjoying whatever we are free in is never worth causing someone else to experience bondage. But Paul uses food in his example because uh, in, in that context, the food that they were wrestling with is, can we eat food that was made for idols? And Paul goes, yeah, I mean, if you're free in Christ, then you know that those idols are, are false gods. So it doesn't actually matter if you're free, if you have the knowledge, you understand that that is meaningless. Then if somebody puts that food in front of you and you want to eat it and you're free in Christ, you won't feel bondage, then eat it. And if not, then don't eat it. He explained all of this, and then, and then he actually, we, we could say, like, there's a ton of issues that in our modern American uh, context we might understand this if we were to update it. But the point still stands. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 8, Paul actually addresses this again. He says, food will not bring us close to God. What he's saying there is don't make this such a big deal. Don't act like eating or not eating is making you righteous. Just be free. He says, food will not bring us close to God. We are not worse off if we don't eat. We're not any better if we do eat. But be careful that this right of yours in no way becomes a stumbling block to the weak. Again, if someone sees you, the one who has knowledge dining in an idol's temple, won't his weak conscience be encouraged to eat the food offered to idols? So the weak person, the brother or sister for whom Christ died, is ruined by your knowledge. Now, when you sin like this, did you catch that? Paul, Straight for the jugular. He calls that sin. When you sin like this against brothers and sisters and wound their weak conscience, you are sinning against Christ. Therefore, if food comes or causes my brother or sister to fall, I will never again eat meat so that I won't cause my brother or sister to fall. I mean, that's quite a bomb that Paul drops. This is sin. This isn't just don't, it's like, it's not just failing to be kind. You are sinning against Jesus when you fail to or refuse to consider your brother or sister's weakness. So, a stumbling block can lead someone into sin, but I would also propose that a stumbling block can be found in the way that we talk about our deeply held beliefs that are not actually essential to our salvation. For example, the physicist, astronomer, and Christian apologist Hugh Ross once wrote, this is an example, he says, to insist that belief in the Bible demands belief in a young earth is to put a stumbling block in the path of many non-believers. It raises the question of why a God who is committed to revealing truth would make the universe and earth measure to be old if in fact they are not. What he's saying there is scientifically it appears that the world is much older than much of the evangelical Western American church says that it is. Just for the record, this is a distinctly American problem in the church. If you go to Europe, for example, and you say, uh, are Christians bound up in worrying about whether or not God created the, the earth in seven literal days or was it over millennia? Um, in the English church, they go, I don't know, what do you say about Jesus? And in the American church, you go, how dare you even ask that question? You must not be a Christian. If you don't believe that God did it in seven literal days, you don't get into heaven. And what Hugh Ross is saying here is, that's like putting a stumbling block in front of people that actually have questions. Now, you might feel like I'm being a little bit passionate about that, and that's because I have a family member that has asked me that exact question. And the question was posed to me like this, Tim, how can I believe in Jesus and the Bible and also science? And I, I, I had to apologize because my initial reaction was to chuckle. And he thought that I was 
making light of his question, and I said, no, I'm, I'm actually laughing at ourselves. Like, I'm laughing at us, at, at how silly we've become. Because I also believe in science. I just happen to believe in the God who created science. And then he goes, well, so what do I do? Can I, can I believe in evolution and creation and Jesus all at the same time? And I said, I only care about one of those things. Can you believe in Jesus? We have said so many times, if you want to be in the kingdom, you must, and then we fill in the blank. We fill in the blank by saying things like, you must believe that the world was created 4,000 years ago, not millions of years ago. By the way, just as a side note, I'm not telling you whether or not I agree with Hugh Ross. I, I wasn't there when God created the world, and I've read the Bible. Like, I've read the Genesis account. In fact, I just read some of it to you this morning, but I wasn't there in the moment. So I don't know if he did that in a literal day or a day to God is like a thousand years. And so each of those days was a millennia. I don't know. And frankly, neither do you. Because even the oldest person in this church wasn't there. It's like we don't know. Right? Right? So I'm not telling you whether or not I agree with him. The point is, when we say things to people who want to be in the Christian faith, that we say things like, if you don't believe in a young earth, you're not a Christian, or if you don't speak in tongues, you're not a Christian, or if you voted for fill in the blank, you're not a Christian, or if you don't vote at all, or if you tell people to wear a mask, or if you tell people not to wear a mask, or if you have tattoos, pause, 50% of that list would make me not a Christian. which was going to make the rest of this sermon super awkward for you. <laughs> so the point here is that we should do everything we can to clear the path. Jesus already said the road into the kingdom of heaven is narrow. And we go, you know what would be really awesome? Let's put a lot of blocks in the narrow road and make it even harder. Why? So that we'll feel smart and like we really know how to be a Christian. You don't. If that's the way you perceive entering into the kingdom must also check all of your personal opinion boxes, then you have become a stumbling block to those who would otherwise give their life to Jesus. And I think we have things to repent about as the American church. So I said to my family member, I said, there's really only one issue, and that is what do you say about Jesus? Do you say that he is the son of God, that he actually lived, actually died, actually rose again from the dead, and that he's currently alive welcoming everyone into the kingdom of heaven who would put their faith in him? What do you say about Jesus? Is he the Lord and savior of your life? That's the question that matters. I do not care if you're an evolutionist. Are you a disciple? Now, buy me a cup of coffee and we'll have a conversation about evolution. It's a wildly interesting conversation. We'll talk about dinosaurs. It's a fun conversation. Buy me a cup of coffee and ask me about politics. Ask me why we made the decisions about mask wearing. All of that gets to be talked about on the inside of the kingdom. But we will never tell someone you only get in the kingdom if you do. So, we are responsible as Christians to keep our brothers and sisters secure in their faith, to keep them from stumbling, and third, to keep your brother supplied. I referenced Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 earlier, and I want to read that again to you, and then we'll get to verse 2, which is where uh, we'll build this point that we are to keep our brothers supplied. It says in Galatians 6, 1, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. And then Paul continues, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. It is a requirement in the kingdom of God that we bear one another's burdens. Now, the early church actually had this mindset. They had a mindset of mutual responsibility whenever somebody had a burden, meaning we're all responsible to care for or meet, for, meet that need or carry that burden. And, and then this manifested itself in physical ways, even financial ways. In Acts chapter 4, we see it says, now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. Could you imagine a community like that? 
Verse 33, and with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them. Rewind. Two chapters in the book of Acts, it said on one day, 3,000 people got saved and joined the church. And then it said people were joining the church every single day. So this is now a church of thousands of people. And it says, there was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as he had need. Now, I am not about to tell you, so therefore we're announcing an an initiative or a movement here at Life Church where we're asking you please to sell your house and bring all of the proceeds here. We've got some nice rooms here at the church. You can all just live on campus. That's not, and I'm not going to take the time to explain to you the cultural distinction of why that was the thing that God was doing then and why it doesn't appear that that's the thing he's doing now. Although I will ask you to hold an open mind about the fact that there may be a day in the future where he would ask us to do that again. But today we make this practical by inviting you to partner with us in all kinds of different ways. And if this isn't your home church, then we're not asking you to partner with us. We're asking you to go and partner with the church that is your home. And we do that financially. You heard me talking about that earlier, right? So when when you give, your resources become community resources so that it can be said of life church, there was not a needy one among them. God spoke through the prophet Malachi in the Old Testament when he said, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour out for you a blessing until there is no more need. So the principle of tithing, again, which we'll talk about this next month, but the principle of tithing is not about paying your pastor's salary. It's about eradicating need through honor of God and love of your brother. Not because God owes you a blessing to the people who tithe. That's not why we do it. But because a tithing church has enough resources to distribute and cover all of the needs. I love hearing the stories on the back end as a pastor. When someone comes to me and they go, I had a need, and somebody in the church helped meet the need. Or when somebody comes to us, in fact, this happened during the height of the COVID-19 crisis, pandemic moments. There were families in our church that came to us and said, we are abundantly blessed in this season. And so we want to let you know that we are available to be a resourcing family for anyone who has need. In fact, one family in particular said, we would be willing to buy groceries uh, a a couple of times a month if that was needed. For any family, somebody who isn't making an income right now because of the stay-at-home orders. Imagine that. I mean, this happened in your church. People, People sitting in this room became a resource for people sitting in this room. That's how we keep our brother supplied. By meeting needs as we see them, by bringing our tithe into the storehouse. And what's the principle for both of those things? It's not that you sell your house. It's that you treat everything you have as a flow through for the benefit of the kingdom of God and your brothers and sisters in Christ. You don't own anything anyway. Everything you have was gifted to you by the Lord. Oh, but I worked hard for this money. Who gave you the talent? Who gave you the breath? Somebody said, who gave you the health? Yeah, you have a job. Thank God. Use the resources as a blessing. Yeah, you bless your family, bless your kids, put a roof over your family's head. Yeah, and then when you see someone who needs a place to stay, would you welcome them? I just, I just wonder what it would look like if we build a church that supercharges the the chesed community that we already have here. I'm not saying this point in this message to, to say, how dare you never care for each other. I'm saying you guys are already great at this. Let's make sure that this, as new people come into our church, as our church grows in this season, we're coming into a building year at Life Church. 
as we come into a building season and new people come in, it is on all of us together to make sure that 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 mentality and culture doesn't get lost in the growth. Otherwise, God, keep our church small enough that we can still meet the needs or make us generous enough that we might grow. We are responsible. I I would maybe just simply say to you, and then we can move on from this point, is that uh, I think you probably are wise and smart enough as I'm looking at who you are. I think you are smart enough to know that we're not just talking about money. Like keeping your brother or sister in Christ secured is, is about love and presence and the gentle community as much as it is about anything else. It's about stopping to pray whenever a point of need or pain comes up. It's about offering kind words or wise counsel whenever a friend feels stuck. And any other way that we can offer somebody something that we have whenever we see that they have a need. In fact, uh, we're instructed like this in Philippians chapter 2. It says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. So to be a brother's keeper means that you consider your brother or sister before yourself to think about their needs, to look for ways to bless them or take care of them, even if it makes you feel uncomfortable. This is loving. This is humble. This is chesed, community of kindness, gentle love. So as we wrap up, let's go back up to the beginning. When sin entered the world, our relationship with God was destroyed. It was broken. And not just our relationship with God, but our community with each other, resulting in the first murder, the murder between brother and brother. But Jesus calls us back into community and says, have a positive answer to the question, am I my brother's keeper? The answer is yes. This has to look like something. It has to look like us doing the work to keep our brothers secure in their faith, to make sure that we keep our sister in Christ from stumbling and to restore them whenever we see that happening and living in repentance and humility whenever we see that we have done something that has made life difficult for somebody else and to keep our brother and sister in Christ supplied. And the benefit of a community that keeps one another like this is that while you keep your brother, your brother is keeping you. This is why church membership is important. This is not a thing of the past to be, the, to be a member of a local church. It is still just as important as it has ever been so that you can em- enjoy the mutual benefit of hased, being your brother's keeper, living in a loving and gentle, caring community. So there's a lot of Sundays where what we'll do is we'll call the prayer team up to the front and we'll offer to minister to you. But I would present a challenge or an invitation to you today that today what we want to actually do is have you turn and pray for one another. So in just a moment, I'm going to pray a blessing over you. And then we're going to keep this simple today. I'm going to pray a blessing. The the blessing is going to be up on the screen. It's four simple lines. And then I'd like to invite you to turn and pray speak that same blessing over somebody around you. You can do this once or twice, ten times if you feel extroverted. But first, before we get to that, can you take a moment and consider your brother, consider your sister? In fact, even with your eyes closed, I wonder who might come into your mind's eye. Who would you see Perhaps this is the Lord reminding you of a person that you know and care about, your brother or sister. Certainly this might be a spouse or a family member. It might be a friend. Who are the people in the community of faith that you know? Who are the members of this church that you know? And I would say if you struggle to think of anybody in Life Church that you know, I in no way mean to make you feel condemned or ashamed by that. But I would invite you to build with us chesed. Maybe you have work to do, and that's okay. But join us in doing the work. So as we think about these brothers and sisters, can we take a moment to pray for them? In fact, just right where you are sitting, take a moment to pray. Pray a blessing for them. God, would you bless? And then maybe say their name before the Lord. God, would you give me opportunities to be a keeper 
for them. Show me the opportunities. Give me the courage. And God, I would pray this over our church before we pray a blessing over one another. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one, and the one true God. We thank you for the ways that you show yourself to us in community and for the ways that you have invited us into community with you. Help us to keep one another in loving community and bless us to be well kept. As we learn to live this way, may your love for each other through us be a message to the world that we are your disciples. And finally, friends, I pray this blessing over you, and then I invite you to turn and pray this same blessing over your friends. May you be kept by God as you keep your faith in him. May you be kept by your brothers and sisters as you bless them in keeping.